The coronavirus pandemic has put the spotlight on the often difficult relationship between science and politics. That we will be in the scientific world, researchers tread a slow and methodical path in the search for truth. But for some politicians, the rush to deliver quick and easy answers to complex questions has made scientific research into a political football. How does the virus spread? Do masks really protect their wearers? Who is most at risk from the pandemic? Researchers are still learning about the virus, trying to understand how it behaves and devising strategies to fight it. They need politicians to turn their findings into public policy. But that collaboration is often far from straightforward. Here in Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel has warned that the number of coronavirus infections could rise to almost 20,000 a day by Christmas if the current trend continues. She says the priority must be to bring numbers down while keeping the economy alive. Throughout the pandemic, she's been shaping her policies around the latest advice from Germany's scientists and researchers. Among the experts that have her ear is the country's most well-known virologist, Christian Drosten. Wear a mask, wash your hands, and maintain distance. People in Germany are accustomed to following these safety and hygiene guidelines. Yet despite this, the rate of infection is climbing, with more than 2,000 new cases in a single day, the highest count since April. Germany's most prominent virologist, Christian Drosten, sees the development critically. He recently spoke at a conference in Berlin and detailed some of his concerns in an interview with Deutsche Welle. Look at other countries, look at France, the UK, Spain. Um, what we're seeing uh, there is what we will see in Germany um, if we don't react very early on um, in, in a way that needs to be adjusted, that needs to be, um, let's say, bearable for the economy um, and at the same time targeted. Um, and this is a, a very difficult task to find the right point of time. Trosten has praise for Germany's coronavirus policies and the response by the country's leadership during the pandemic. He says Germany has been efficient and measures have softened the pandemic's impact. But he also says the government could do a better job of explaining why certain decisions are made. Um, it is not sufficient to impose rules that people don't understand. Um, so the cooperation of the population, especially in the coming weeks and months to, over, over, over autumn and, and winter, um, is probably one of the most important functions in, in the whole concept to, to intervene. Drosten says from a global perspective, current developments in India are particularly worrying. The virus is spreading there almost uncontrollably. And he says the situation in many Western countries could also become more threatening. There are areas, uh, including in Europe, where uh, there is little control, where countries already go into autumn with a high um, background incidence. I, I believe um, there are countries, including in, in Europe, uh, that will have to impose stricter me measures very soon. As Germany and the world prepare for a likely second major wave of new COVID-19 infections in the coming months, now more than ever, politics and science need to work hand in hand. Let's bring in Professor Ulrich Diernagel. He's a neurologist at Berlin's Charité Hospital and the founding director of the Quest Center for Transforming Biomedical Research. Professor Diernagel, thank you so much for joining us. How has the coronavirus changed the relationship between science and politics? I don't think this relationship has changed in principle. Scientists provide evidence and politicians may or may not act accordingly. But what I guess is different, for example, to the scientific council regarding climate change is that it is in the nature of an emerging pandemic that the available evidence is often tentative and new evidence leads to new interpretations and new recommendations, potentially even reversals. So in general, politicians don't have a good track record in following sound scientific advice. I mean, think climate change again. It's therefore no big surprise to me that politicians have difficulties in following scientific advice if it is based on preliminary evidence and reckoning by statistical models. 
Now, as we saw in that report there, here in Germany, Christian Drosten, he's become a household name. How much influence would you say individual scientists have on politicians? I guess you have to ask these scientists. Generally, they will downplay their influence. But for us observers, it appears that some scientists are indeed highly influential. I guess it's obvious, for example, in Sweden, where the, the state epidemiologist Anders Tegnell has the say, or officially Anthony Fauci in the US, although he seems to be marginalized by Trump. Um, but take the UK, for example, it's quite likely that Neil Ferguson and his model of the potential death toll triggered a policy reversal in the UK and led to the lockdown. Um, what is problematic in my view is that it's, and it's not the scientists who are to be blamed for, that scientific advisory is presently not guided by four relevant principles. Uh, advisories should be inclusive, that is, include many sources, expertise, stakeholders. It should be rigorous, that's comprehensive, free of bias, independent review, and transparent, that it should declare conflicts of interest, assumptions, limitations, gaps, and it should also be accessible, that is, freely available uh, in a plain language. And, and we don't see that at the moment in any country. And expanding on what you're saying there, do you think scientists are under pressure to advance a certain political agenda in all this? Well, in every country, politicians now claim to act according to best available science. But what is this best available science? Someone has said that it's a case of survival of the ideas that fit. So politicians tend to favor the kind of science that aligns with their existing preferences. What's special to political actions or inactions in the pandemic is that they are felt immediately and viscerally by everyone. Uh, it's, it's days instead of years, as with climate change. So if a prominent epidemiologist recommends closure of schools and the government indeed closes schools, the scientist becomes an immediate target for those opposing this measure. So I guess this puts tremendous pressure on scientists giving advice. And on the whole, then, would you say the attention the coronavirus is getting right now is good or bad for science? I, I guess a little bit of both. Uh, and, and the jury is still out whether positive or negative effects will prevail. Science helps to contain and eventually eradicate the threat. This will reflect positive on, on science, I hope. On the other hand, many of the measures taken have unintended consequences harming many people. And as I said just now, therefore, uh, it's straightforward to blame scientists for all the negative consequences. Even within science, um, I guess it's not black and white. On the positive side are new forms of disseminating evidence, scientific discussions, which are currently popularized. Think, uh, for example, preprints. Um, scientific collaboration also gets a push. But on the other hand, we see a, a, what's been called a COVIDization of research. Resources and expertise is funneled away from areas which deserve equal attention, think TB, malaria, cancer. And there's increasing noise, making it harder to focus on the signal that's the robust and relevant research results. Plus, we see what has been called research exceptionalism, uh, and that's mm -hmm. under the banner bad data is better than no data, and that's clearly dangerous, especially in, in, in the conditions of a, of a pandemic. So pros and cons there. Professor Ulrich Diernagel from Berlin Charité, thanks so much for speaking to us. Thank you very much. Time now to answer one of your questions about the coronavirus. Over to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. If I think I had the virus but couldn't be tested, could the vaccine actually be dangerous for me? Well, we don't know, at least not yet, but presumably the answer to this question and others like it will be provided by the extensive phase three testing that a number of vaccine candidates are going through now. Um, they involve tens of thousands of volunteers and some of them, I'm sure, will have already had COVID-19. Um, in most other diseases, there aren't mechanisms that would cause someone who had them to react badly to subsequent vaccinations. Um, I think the assumption most experts would make is that with COVID-19, uh, vaccinating someone who has already had the virus will generally act more like a booster shot, reminding the immune system um, that SARS-CoV-2 is still around and putting it back on high alert. Which isn't to say that potential vaccines won't have any side effects. Um, in fact, reports so far imply that some, if not most, candidates are, are pretty reactogenic, which means uh, they can cause discomfort, ranging from, from headache to 
soreness at the injection site to fatigue or, or fever. Um, but the big question is whether those side effects are seen as acceptable in terms of tolerability. Um, if some people get a headache for a couple of hours the day after a vaccination, um, that would probably be considered uh, an acceptable trade-off. Um, if their temperature spikes dramatically, then it wouldn't. Uh, that's at least in part what, what phase three testing in vaccines is about. Uh, one thing it's meant to do is identify as many rare adverse events as possible in big test cohorts to evaluate as many potential dangers as possible um, before you give a vaccine to the wider population. And we leave you with this. Spain has been one of the European countries hardest hit by COVID-19. Over the weekend, activists placed thousands of Spanish flags in a park in the capital, Madrid, to mourn the over 30,000 people who've lost their lives to the disease. In recent weeks, the city has become one of Europe's coronavirus hotspots. The secret action was also meant as a sign of protest and a call on the government to do more to stop the spread of the virus.